Hallelujah. All right. Welcome back again, everybody, to Friday Night Bible Study slash Youth Group for those of us here in person. We're going to talk about something that the Lord has been dealing with me about to share for quite a while, actually. I don't know how much we'll get through tonight. This might be a this might be a multi service you know sermon a series if you will um we're going to call it the devil's attempts to stop the plan of god the devil's attempts to stop the plan of god kind of what we're going to do is take a little bit of a history tour through the bible um and look and see you know the the, the devil has been trying to stop the plan of god since the very beginning and we're going to see some things how He's been how he's been attempting, how he's been trying to do that ever since ever since the very beginning. If you've got a Bible, I'd invite you to turn with us to Genesis chapter three. And we're going to go to verse verse 14. Before we read, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who brings us and gives us the anointing, causes us to see things clearly causes us to, to, to have revelation knowledge, Lord, to, to see things and know things and understand things that we previously would not understand. Thank you that you make it easy for us, Lord. You're the one who wrote the book, and we trust you and rely on you to teach us tonight. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for grace for all of us to receive what you have for us. We bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14. This chapter is what's called the fall of man. Adam and Eve are in the garden and the devil's there. You know, we were talking about angels before, just before service started. And it's interesting, you know, angels can, for lack of a better term, angels are shapeshifters. The, the, the true biblical depiction of most angels, it's just funny because we were talking about it. You guys brought it up. Uh, maybe I did, I don't know. But we've got cherubim, seraphim, the, the Hebrew word is ophanim, for the wheels within wheels, right? Um, the archangels, and then we've got just the basic, what we would call just regular angels, but there's nothing regular about them. Um, they're all supernatural. They're all fantastical. And the Bible displays that they have a true form, and the same way, honestly, that God has a true form. God said to Moses, if I, if I was to appear in my full glory, you would not be able to survive. So I'll hide you. I'll put you behind the cleft of the rock, and I will walk by. That was the day that Moses got the Ten Commandments. So he, he didn't even see the fullness of God. And yet when Moses walked off of the mountain and he had the Ten Commandments and he had the blueprints for the temple, the tabernacle, um, the Bible says that he was glowing. Like he, he, he looked like he was, you know, somebody stuck a neon light in him somehow. And he was just like beaming. And the people were like trying to hide away from it. And that was because the presence of God did that to him. The glory of God did that to him. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 14, this is Adam and Eve had already eaten the, uh, the fruit of the tree. And the Lord is describing the consequences now. Verse 14, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. And I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And then he, told, he tells stuff to Eve and also to Adam. We're going to stop here and just go over this portion of Scripture because this is really all that pertains to our study tonight. The devil's attempts to stop the plan of God. What this portion of Scripture is, Genesis chapter 3, this is the first word of prophecy given in the Bible. And notice it's not a prophet who gives it. It's God himself. This is the first time that any foretelling of the future, right, foretelling of what's going to happen, Somewhere down the road, this is the first prophecy of the Bible, and it's God the Father who says it. People who say the Bible is just another book, they don't really understand what the Bible is. It's very easy to, let me put it this way, it's very easy to prove that the Bible was written from an external source, external meaning, outside of time and space, outside of what we would view as, you know, humanity thinks of time as a, as a line, right? Chronologically, You've got things in the past, things in the future, but God exists outside of that. You cannot box him into this concept called time. We've got him, you know, we think of time a certain way, but God exists outside of time. He can see the end from the beginning. And the, what, the, what the Lord Jesus, even his ministry, what was proved 
over and over in his ministry was he would he would pro, he would fulfill prophecy, and it's like that was the validation to his ministry. That was the validation that people could see everywhere that he went. He they would hear the stories. He was raised, in, you know, he was born and put in a manger, right? He was uh, raised in Nazareth. The Bible said he'd be a Nazarene. There's over 300 prophecies given about Jesus. And people say, well, you know, it's it's just coincidence. You know, it's coincidental that somebody, it's not coincidence. It's it's a coincidence if one or two maybe are fulfilled. And even then, that's a stretch. But, you know, if you go even as far as like four prophecies the, the, or eight prophecies, however many you want to take, the odds of one person fulfilling even eight out of 300 odd prophecies, it's like one in a trillion because these prophecies are so specific and they're so time sensitive, <laughs> right? Like we couldn't have somebody fulfill these prophecies nowadays because of the conditions of the day. We're only that way for a certain amount of time. People say, well, why didn't Jesus come right after this curse? This is Genesis chapter 3. And why, why didn't God just in Genesis chapter 4 send Jesus? Because there was this whole thing of prophecy had to be laid out and then fulfilled. Back to verse 15. We're going to go here. We're going to hop to the end of the book. And then we're going to come through and go in the middle and see the story of how this plays out. But verse 15 again, I will cause hostility between you and the woman talking to the devil between you and mankind between your offspring and her offspring. We'll come back to that. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. This again, this is the first prophecy of the Bible. What he's talking about directly is talking about Jesus. He's prophesying about the Messiah, the, the Savior that's going to come and restore humanity to what it was in the Garden of Eden, basically. They did not have sin. They never experienced a bad day. They were never, ever sick. So much so, like the, the conditions of their day, animals had never been, had never died before. There was never death on the earth. And Jesus was going to come and ultimately restore that condition back to mankind. And it's going to start in the, in the hearts of people as individuals. But then in the fullness of time, right, as the prophecies begin to be fulfilled and the book of Revelation takes place, we all of a sudden, the devil is removed from the earth. Jesus comes here to, to physically rule and reign, you know, with his government as King Jesus, as the actual monarch of, the, of legalism, as of the legal system, I should say. Like he institutes a nation, he institutes a nationality. He fulfills not just all the prophecies about himself, but all the prophecies of, of Israel, all the stuff that has to do with the church. And Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. And from that point on, there's never going to be death again. There will never be a sickness, right? There will never be any more sin. It's been done away with and we've been restored. Basically, we've been restored back to Eden the way that it used to be. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Lord, your word is amazing. I thank you for it. So I told you we'd start in the very beginning. It's the first prophecy of the Bible, and it has to do with Jesus, the Messiah. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the east, from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose. We have come to worship him. There's more detail about the birth of Jesus in the book of Luke. We won't go there just for time's sake. Verse 3, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. Here again, so we've got the, this idea that prophecy foretells the future and that the, the stage has to be set before Jesus can arrive on the scene. In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. 
Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So the, the, the wise men, so to speak, from the east come and they visit this land. There's a supernatural star, a sign from God in the sky that appears and it leads them to where Jesus is. Jesus is already about two years old at this point. He's a toddler. He's not just, you know, born last week or whatever. Um... They have this conversation with Herod, and he plays it off as if, oh yeah, I want to go and meet this guy. I want to go and worship. Let me know when you find him so I can go and give gifts and bow down and worship him too, just like he wanted. He's got an ulterior motive. He thinks all of a sudden they have come and they, they let him know that there's, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Where is the guy that's gunning for your spot, right, in the, in the political realm? Oh, ruler of Jerusalem, right? And he's nervous. He's scared. He's like, oh, there's... All of a sudden, there's this newborn king of the Jews. I have to stop that. I, I'm, I'm too comfortable here in my, my career political, you know. I like being the king of this region. I don't want to give that up. God warns the wise men, go home a different route, right? And we'll see why this happens. Can we skip ahead? Um, no, let's see. Verse 13. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. There's so many of those little asides. If you read the scriptures and you read the gospels, it's like every other paragraph. And this was done to fulfill what scripture had said and yada, yada, yada. There are so many prophecies, and it was specifically geared to be about Jesus. Verse 16, Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under. Based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance, Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. We're going to go through now, and we'll, we'll try at least start this, but I don't know how much we'll get through. The, again, the devil's attempts to stop the plan of God. Over and over and over in history, we see how, how the devil comes against the Jewish people. He comes against Abraham and his family. He comes against uh, humanity itself. You know, the days of Noah, and then there's the flood. And it's over and over, the devil's trying to get this Messiah to not be born. Stop the plan of God, because he was there in the garden when God said, I'm going to send somebody. You're going to hurt him, right? You're going to injure him. The Bible says you're going to bruise his heel. That's what that means. You're going to, you know, you're going to hurt him. I bet it hurt being on that cross, right? <laughs> but he said, he is going to crush your head. And that's what Jesus actually did on the cross. That wasn't just so that he could have a bad day for us. That was so that he could pay the price for our sins. And the Bible says that if the devil had known, actually, let's just turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. First Corinthians chapter two, verse seven. No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, his plan that was previously hidden, even though he made it for our ultimate glory before the world began. But the rulers, here we go, of this world have not understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified our glorious Lord. If they understood what was actually happening that day when Jesus was crucified, that that prophecy was fulfilled. The Bible says that the devil and his people would not have done it. They walked right into God's trap. 
The devil was right there when God gave the prophecy. And the devil knew Bible prophecy probably more than anybody alive outside of Jesus. And yet he didn't get it. He didn't see that when Jesus dies on that cross and gives up his life, the devil thought he was just putting a stop to the Messiah. And he, you know, you've done enough on planet Earth. You can do no more because I've won. But he didn't realize that that was part of the plan. Jesus was put on that cross, not just to, 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 to die a painful death, but he became sin, the Bible says. The story in the Old Testament, we went to it on Sunday even. Pastor Nick shared a little bit about it. The story in the Old Testament, the people, they had sinned, and the earth itself caused these, these poisonous flaming snakes to come up from the ground and bite the people. And everybody that, they, that the snakes would bite, they would die. And God told Moses, Moses cried out, Lord, what are we supposed to do now? We've sinned. Please forgive us. And the Lord tells Moses, put, a, put a, a bronze snake on a pole and raise it up. And anybody who looks at that snake on the pole in faith will be healed. And even if the snakes bite them, they won't die from it. They'll live. What that means, again, that's a type and a shadow of Jesus. That's a picture, a prophetic picture of Jesus, the guy on the cross, who would one day become sin for us. See, why was it a snake? Because that was what was killing them? In a measure, yes, but he be, Jesus became sin. He became the snake, right? He became what was causing the problem. And then God, supernaturally, you know, divinely, basically, he took the nail himself and drove it right through Jesus. In that moment, Jesus was not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus had become sin. He took on our condition and he gave up his own condition. He gave up perfection. He gave up godliness so he could become like us. So that he could take on the sins of the whole world. And in that very moment, the devil thought he had won, right? We're just going to put a stop to Jesus and to stop his ministry and stop the, the plan of God. But God took the nail himself, basically. He, walked the, he, he, he drove the nail through that cross. Stored in the Old Testament of Abraham and Isaac, right? Abraham, go to the top of Mount Moriah, sacrifice your son Isaac. Isaac is not a little boy. He's not like 10 years old. He's probably my age. <laughs> he was in on it. It wasn't like, okay, Dad, why are you tying me to this thing? Well, this is a little uncomfortable and weird. What's... No, he was very much aware of what was going on. He knew. And he said, Lord, I believe the same way that my father Abraham does. If, if my father plunges that knife into my heart, you're going to raise me up because the promise is that I would have children and that your line would continue through me. So it was Isaac's faith just as much as Abraham's faith, right? It was Jesus' faith just as, as much as it was the plan of God. Jesus didn't try and hop off that cross. Right? He said, I could, if I wanted to, call down legions of angels to come and untie me and take me away from here. But I will not do that. I choose not to. Right? So that I can fulfill the plan of God. And that way, that, that prophetic story right, of Abraham and Isaac. I, Abraham's about to plunge the knife into his son. And then an angel appears and says, Abraham, stop. Look and see there's a ram caught in the thicket. And they sacrifice the ram. Interesting about this, I was studying it recently, but this, that story in Genesis of Abraham and Isaac, it labels it as Mount Moriah. There's only two verses in the Bible where Mount Moriah is mentioned. And I don't want to go into it now. There's a lot of you know, resources and study that we could do. But uh, the place that Jesus was crucified in the New Testament is called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Mount Moriah... And Golgotha, for all intents and purposes, are the same place. And nobody really picks up on this. Nobody seems to, to get this. But I believe even almost the exact same spot where Abraham was about to plunge his knife into Isaac, that same hilltop was where Jesus was put on the cross. It was thousands of years in, in between. And yet the, the name of the location changed. But geographically, it was the same spot. God is like, I don't care about what... I'm just going to step over borders right, and boundaries and, and people's preconceptions of what this place is supposed to be. This was the spot. <laughs> and this is where the crucifixion is going to take place. See, God's prophetic timing, his, his ability to predict the future, He does not have to abide by our sense of time. He does not have to abide by you know, geographical boundaries and stuff. He does what He needs to do. 
So I believe that the spot where Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac was the same spot where Jesus' cross was. And that's amazing to me. But we have, yeah, we have here, so Herod gives the order, kill all the baby boys two years and under. Again, why two years and under? Because Jesus was two years old at this point, judging by what the wise men said about the star. We've been traveling for two years, Herod, right? Oh, okay. Um, so let's kill all the baby boys two years and under. Jesus was in Egypt, or at least on his way to Egypt. An angel comes and visits them again, says, hey, Herod's dead. Now return back to Nazareth. So just one of a hundred examples, the devil tries to stop Jesus even from being born. He tries to stop him before he was born. He tries to stop him before he can grow up. Uh, the story Luke uh, chapter 3, chapter 4, I believe, when he's a, a teenager, he's 12 years old, he's in the temple, and he's teaching the teachers, and Joseph and Mary get separated from him, and they're, they're off doing their own thing. I believe that the devil somehow was getting in there. He was going to try and cause Jesus to be permanently separated from his family. And yet the Lord was able to, to uh, you know, um, alert Mary and Joseph, hey, by the way, your son's not with you. <laughs> And like good parents, they turn around and they go back. They're looking for him. Um, other times, even in Jesus' own ministry, we're in Matthew, or we're in First uh, Corinthians. Let's go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter four. Even in Jesus' earthly ministry, the devil tries to stop Jesus. He realizes if, if in fact Jesus is this promised Messiah. If I manage to kill him before he has a chance to fulfill the, the prophet, the prophecy, then all this could be for nothing. And I effectively have beaten God. Matthew chapter four, verse one. This is the temptation of Jesus. There's this interesting story that's in this gospel and at least one more of an actual conversation that the devil has with Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by, there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's three things that the, that the devil says to Jesus here. We'll skip through for time's sake. Verse 10, get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Even in Jesus' ministry, the devil is trying to stop him. The devil's trying to distract him, to derail him. He offered him three shortcuts, basically. You know, let's just go ahead and, and read it. Verse 4, Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil was tempting Jesus. You've got the power. You're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Go ahead and do something about it. And Jesus, he's basically, he's just sticking it to the man. He's like, no, I'm not going to do what you say. Just for the very fact that you said it. Did he have the ability to turn stones into bread? Of course he did. But it was the devil that recommended it. And he's not going to have any part of that. <laughs> so it's like, I'm going to go hungry. Just because you brought it up, devil, I will, I will go nowhere near what you recommend, what you, what you tell me to do. Verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Excuse me, basically, don't be stupid. <laughs> If the, if the Lord didn't tell you to do something, then don't do it. The Gospels, they tell the story of Jesus. He would, over, he would go over the sea, right? He would talk to these people. He, he approached the demoniac, the guy with legion, right? 20,000 demons. That was not just, oh, I'm, I feel like taking a walk today. Oh, I'm going to go and meet some people. Oh, who is that? That's that crazy demon possessed guy. I'm just going to go say hi. That was not like nonchalant. That was spirit directed. Everything that Jesus did was spirit-directed. 
Verse 8, next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of Jesus. Another translation says the devil left him for a season. So the devil realized I'm not getting anywhere today. So I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing for now. And that's the, devil, that's the way the devil operates in our lives too. If you haven't realized that. He'll come when you're at your weakest point, And then if you decide oh, I'm just going to succumb to it. I'll give in to temptation. Right? I'll do whatever he says to do. You make it easier for him to come the next time. And it'll become more subtle. And it become, you know, you won't pick up on it as much. And then a couple years down the road, you'll be like, how did I wind up here? Yeah. It's those small things. If you don't put a stop to it early on, it's just going to develop into more of a problem. God's an expert at, at stopping problems, right? He's an expert weed killer, whatever, <laughs> uprooting weeds, if you would. But it's better. I mean, no, it's better to not get to that point in the first place. It's better to not let that stuff develop until God has to surgically remove it from you. And because how many know surgery is painful. <laughs> There's rehab involved in surgery. And it's the same way spiritually. Because there's people that go their whole lives and they, 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 they have these evil habits and they do things over and over and over. And the Lord's telling them, stop, 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 stop. And then eventually his voice becomes so distant and they've, they've seared their conscience to it. Lord, I don't want what you have to say. Stop reminding me. Stop telling me what the Bible says. And all of a sudden his voice gets quieter and quieter and they don't want to pay attention. Is it because he's not trying? No, he's trying very much. <laughs> they just keep saying, I don't want your help. And eventually, they, they, the, the Bible talks about having a seared conscience. What it means to sear something. Like, you ever played, um, I don't know, I don't even know what, um, seen it in a movie maybe, like they've got this, this hot iron, like a, a symbol on a stick, they put it in the fire and then they stick it on somebody and all of a sudden they got this symbol burned into, a, into their skin. That's what searing means. So you've basically done that enough times to your conscience so that you've burned it away. So that you don't have a, con a clear conscience anymore. And you can no longer tell, am I doing what's right? Am I doing what's wrong? This is cloudy. This is confusing. This, I, don't, I don't understand where I am anymore. Because you've, you've basically done it to yourself. You said, Lord, I don't want your help. I just, I would uh, sear your own conscience. I, I'd rather do things my way. And all of a sudden it burns that away. And you become not sensitive. You become dull to the voice of God. He doesn't want us to get to that point. So again, let's go over this real quick. We talked about in the beginning, God gives the first prophecy. Jesus is born. So obviously that, that prophecy is in the process of being fulfilled. And even in, in Jesus' day, uh, the devil stirs up Herod, right? Kill the babies. Stop him from growing up. When he's a grown man, just at the start of his ministry, I'm going to go and tempt him with a shortcut, right? An easy way out. And the Bible says these are temptations. This was actually something that Jesus was attracted to in a way. He had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The dude was hungry. <laughs> Go ahead and turn those stones to rocks. Right? What's the next one? Took him to the, to the top of the temple right in Jerusalem. If you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect you. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. In a way, that was a true temptation for Jesus. Show off, why don't you? Right? I know you believe you've got the power, so why not just have a little fun with it? Do something just for the sake of doing it. You don't have to obey the voice of God, right? You just do things your own way. If you really are God, it won't matter anyway. And he's like, no, I'm not going to fall for this trick. I'm only going to do what I know is right to do. I'm not just going to do something because I can do it. I'm only going to do it if I, if I know in my heart that's what God wants me to do. Yeah. And then next, he took him, he, the devil took Jesus to the peak of a very high mountain, it says, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. The Bible says that the, that the devil is the, is the little g God of this world. When Adam and Eve ate of that tree in the Garden of Eden, they sold out their right to rule creation to the devil. And that is not like a permanent thing. That is, you know, it's the reason why the Lord Jesus, one of the reasons why the Lord Jesus hasn't returned yet. 
because this is it's time sensitive yeah. for lack of a better word the devil owns the lease but that that lease is not forever right like you lease a car uh, you if you don't pay the bill right all of a sudden the bill comes due and they, they could repossess your car yeah. it's the same thing with planet earth basically yeah. Jesus severed the devil's lease but the time still has to run out so in the meantime, the devil is just trying to, to persuade as many people to go against Jesus as possible until the, the day finally comes when the bill is due and Jesus has the ability to come down again. And, you know, then the rapture takes place, the second coming of Jesus, and then we're halfway through the book of Revelation yeah. and then the end of it all. If there's more we could do. We'll probably stop for tonight. Let's just make sure. Next time we come together, it won't be next week. Uh, it'll be the week after. After we end the, the message, I'll, um, I'll explain why. Um, but let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We appreciate you. Sir, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your, for your spirit. Thank you for revealing truth to us. Lord, we just bless you. We love you. Thank you for, for being all that you are in us and through us. Thank you for teaching us, Lord. Thank you for, for sending Jesus to take our place, to become sin for us, to die on that cross, to take our place, to pay the price that was due each and every single one of us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the open door to heaven that we could come and approach you and call you Father. Lord, we just love you. We appreciate you tonight. Thank you for the rest of our night as we go downstairs and enjoy being together. Lord, a special blessing upon everybody who's watching now and also later on Facebook and YouTube. We thank you for branding this into our hearts and helping us to become more and more like you every day, every time that we listen to one of these services, that we apply ourselves to your word, that we would seek you more and more. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next time will be Sunday and um, Sunday morning. Actually, I'm speaking. Come on out. I've got something good. I promise. And um, we'll see you again next time. Have a great night. God bless you. We love you.